Do you want to learn how to take better photos? You do? Well, you're in the right place. And so do I. Hi, and a very warm welcome to episode 177, no less, of the Photography Explained podcast. I'm your host, Rick, and in each episode, I will try to explain one photographic thing to you in plain English in less than 27 minutes-ish without the irrelevant details. I'm a professionally qualified photographer based in England with a lifetime of photographic experience, which I share with you in my podcast. Okay, then here is the answery bit. This is how to take a photo. One, choose your composition carefully. Two, check your camera settings. Three, decide where you're going to focus. Four, take a meter reading. Five, if all is good, get yourself steady. Six, hold the camera correctly. Seven, breathe in. Eight, breathe out slowly. Nine, gently roll your finger over the shutter button, focus, meter and take the photo. Ten, and relax. Eleven, check what you've got. Twelve, and hopefully move on. Simple, this is how you take a photo. I'll cover these quickly now and then cover taking a photo with a tripod, which is what I do. Now, I'm assuming in all of this good stuff that you've got your camera set up sorted. More on this in the next episode, episode 178. And let's not forget what this is all about, which is trying to take high quality photos. Everything's about trying to take better photos. Okay then, number one, choose your composition carefully. Now, I think I've covered this already. Well, I have covered it, haven't I? So check out the previous episodes for lots more on this. So again, another another assumption, another starting point. You know what you're photographing. So now it's time to take those photos. Two, check your camera settings. Well, we'll start with exposure. Now, this is essential. You must get the exposure correct. The exposure is a combination of aperture, shutter speed and ISO. And if you're shooting in program mode, that's fine. No one will criticise you for shooting in program mode. And if they do, send them to me. The same applies to all those other automatic modes which are available on cameras these days. My advice is to use them and learn from them. But have the aim in mind of being able to take photos in manual mode at some point. Now I use a semi-automatic mode, AV, aperture value or aperture priority. I set the aperture and the camera sets the shutter speed to give me the correct exposure for the ISO that I've set, obviously, but I'll come on to that. And to all those people who say, oh, if you don't shoot in manual mode, you're not a real photographer. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. If you shoot in manual mode and you use the camera settings that it tells you to, you're just doing what the camera tells you to anyway. So it's not that it's no different from using any other mode, really. More importantly, I would rather you enjoy your photography using the auto modes in your camera than feel pressured to use manual mode and struggle and not enjoy taking photos and possibly give up because it's too complicated. As a quick aside there, it's not that complicated. It's not too bad to do. It's just one of those things you need to get your head around at some point. And once the penny drops, a lot of things will make more sense. So don't give up on manual mode, but use the automatic modes if you want to. But learn from what the camera's doing and what the settings are doing. So how do you get the correct exposure? Well, the exposure is a combination of the aperture and the shutter speed. The aperture determines how much light gets through to the sensor and the shutter speed determines the amount of time the shutter is exposed to light. And the ISO changes the brightness of the image. Now, the ISO does not change the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. Easy for you to say, Rick. It's changing the brightness. That's what it's doing. So that's what you do. You look through the viewfinder. You press the shutter button halfway, and some light should appear in your viewfinder. Now, I can't tell you what they all mean, but in general terms, you're good to go if nothing's flashing. Now, in manual mode, you're going to have to adjust the aperture or the shutter speed until the dial thingy, the pointy thingy, is in the middle saying correct exposure. So in manual mode, you might not get flashing stuff. And in the semi-automatic modes, you don't have to worry about that. And the automatic modes, the same, because the camera's doing stuff for you. So it is that simple. 
take a photo, see what you get. Now zoom in on your LCD screen and make sure that everything's sharp. Now again, if there's part of the photo that's underexposed or overexposed, the camera should tell you. Those areas should be highlighted in some way on your LCD screen. But if all looks good, then you're okay as you are. If the photo's too dark, the photo is underexposed and you need more light. And to do this, use a larger aperture, a slower shutter speed, or lastly, a higher ISO value. And if the photo's too light, it's overexposed and you need less light. So you use a smaller aperture, a faster shutter speed, or a lower ISO. I always have to check these because sometimes I get them mixed up. It's, it's easy to do. <laughs> I should know by now, shouldn't I? But you've got to be careful with these things. Make sure I'm giving you the right information. So changing each of these has consequences that you need to be aware of. That's aperture, shutter speed and ISO. So next I'm going to cover aperture and then shutter speed and then ISO. And if you're in an automatic mode, the camera will choose these for you. But they can be specific to the mode that you've chosen. Right then, aperture. So the aperture determines how much light gets through to the camera sensor and also the amount of depth of field you get in a photo. Now, what's the aperture? Well, it's the thing within the lens that makes the opening in the lens smaller. The aperture, like I say, it also controls the depth of field, or as I like to call it, depth of sharpness. Use a large aperture, unfortunately a small aperture number, if you want to blur the background or isolate details. Use a small aperture, larger aperture number, to get more depth of field. It, it really frustrates me that a large aperture is a small aperture number, and a small aperture is a large aperture number. There is a very good reason for this, but it doesn't help us, does it? So what's depth of field? Depth of field is the amount of a photo that is sharp from front to back. And now it's got nothing to do with fields. And that's why I call it depth of sharpness, because that's what it is. One more thing on aperture. You need to remember that using the maximum or the minimum apertures will result in some loss of image quality. The sharpest bit is somewhere in the middle. I'm talking F8, F11, that kind of thing. OK, shutter speed. The shutter speed is the amount of time that the shutter is open exposing the camera sensor to light. It is not the speed of the shutter. So why is it called shutter speed? If it was called exposure time, that would make more sense, wouldn't it? A fast shutter speed can freeze a moving object, while a slow shutter speed blurs moving objects. And that's the big difference. Take a photo handheld with a slow shutter speed and you will probably get a blurry photo. So you need to choose a shutter speed that allows you to take sharp photos and also gives you the correct exposure. If you're shooting handheld, your shutter speed should be the reciprocal of the focal length. Now that's, that's, <laughs> that's the term for it, but let me explain it. It sounds a lot worse than it is. If I'm shooting at 100mm, I need to use a shutter speed of one one hundredth of a second or faster. This is the rule of thumb. It's a very well proven rule of thumb, so we can go with it. So if you're shooting 100mm, your shutter speed will be a minimum of one one hundred and twenty-fifth of a second. If I'm shooting at 50mm, one sixtieth of a second. Hopefully you get the idea. ISO, the third element in the exposure triangle. Now, we, we talk about the exposure triangle, but I've never used the exposure triangle. That's why I don't talk about it here, because I never use it. ISO is the sensitivity of the camera sensor to light. Now, we've got these terms called base ISO and native ISO, which, which are quite often get mixed up. So, which ISO should you use? Well, taking my Canon 6D, for example... The camera manual states that the camera has an ISO range of 100 to 25,600. I use the lowest ISO, which is 100, which, in my opinion, gives me the highest image quality. Now, in my Canon 6D, I could use 200 or 400, and I probably wouldn't notice the difference. Here's an extract from the Canon 6D manual. High ISO speeds will result in grainier images. Now, what is a high ISO? For the purposes of this episode, use the lowest ISO possible to get a sharp, handheld photo. 
If you're given a choice between a sharp photo with noise and a blurry photo with no noise, you choose the latter. Noise is digital bad stuff you get when you use higher ISOs. So like I say, 100, 200, 400, probably fine with the Canon 6D. 800, okay, 1600, we're beginning to get problems. 3200, it's going to start going downhill from there. But you need to work out the ISO for your camera. Use the lowest ISO you can to get a sharp photo. That's the bit I want to get over here. Nobody wants a blurry photo, do they? So the aperture and the shutter speed, along with the ISO, they determine the exposure of an image. And if you're using an automatic mode, the camera does this for you. So either way, having worked out what we're taking a photo of and having the camera sorted, we need to decide where to focus, which is number three. Decide where you're going to focus. Where you focus is important. Typically, you will focus on the subject. If that's a person, it will be their eyes. If it's a building, it will probably be the bit nearest to you. If it's a landscape, it will be something way away. If it's a landscape, it will be something far away. But you probably have the stuff in the foreground as well. I'm just correcting it will be some way away from the script, which wasn't great. Focus on the subject. 99 times out of 100, you will want the subject sharp. The aperture, in combination with the focal length, will determine how sharp the photo is from front to back. And that is a choice that you have to make. Number four, take a meter reading. Press the shutter button halfway and you should see some lights appear. If nothing's flashing, you're usually good to go. If something is flashing, you probably need to do something. It depends on your camera, of course, but the one that we don't want flashing is the shutter speed thing, because that's warning you that there's a risk of camera shake. And if you get camera shake, which isn't the camera shaking, it's your camera moving, well, faster than the shutter speed, giving you a blurry photo. We don't want that. Camera shake's another term that I love, because it's implying that your camera's shaking, which it isn't. So check your shutter speed and adjust as described above. Or put your camera on a tripod, of course, which is what I do. Number five, if all is good, get yourself steady. What do I mean by this? Well, this is what I mean. Stand naturally with your legs apart at 45 degree-ish angles. Bend your knees a little bit. Basically, get yourself standing as naturally stable as you can. Whatever the best way is for you to create your own stable base, just... Think of yourself as a human tripod, but with two legs. <laughs> it's all about being in a nice, stable position, nice and relaxed and comfortable and stable. Six, hold the camera correctly. This is how I hold my Canon 6D. I hold the camera in my right hand with the grip and I cradle the bottom of the camera body and lens with my left hand. My finger is naturally near the shutter button. And this is why I love taking photos with my camera. I mean, my Canon 6D, it fits like a glove in my hands. Oh, OK, it's not really a glove, is it? But you know what I mean. It's, it's ergonomically excellent. Seven, breathe in. Yup, breathe in. A nice, slow, deep breath. Number eight, breathe out slowly. Nice and slow now. Number nine. As you're breathing out, gently roll your finger over the shutter button, focus, meter, and take the photo. Like I say, do this as you're breathing out, and you should be as still as you can be. Number 10, relax. You've done it. You've taken your photo. 11, check what you got. Have a quick look at the screen on your camera. And then number 12, hopefully you're good to go. You can move on. Yes, hopefully you have that one photo you are after. That's one photo. So it's time to move on. Now, you don't need to take another photo, do you? No, you don't. You got the one photo that you needed. Not from there, not of the same subject. Go and find something else. Why do I use a tripod to take photos? Well, it's simple. It, it helps me with my compositions and it means I don't need to worry about the shutter speed as my camera's rock solid on my tripod. I use the camera self-timer to take photos, not a remote release because I've had millions of them. Okay, I haven't had millions of those. I've had a number of remote releases over the years and the 10-second self-timer works for me. 
and using the self timer it means that I'm not moving the camera when I'm taking a photo because I've gently pressed the shutter release button or shutter button which do you call it shutter button shutter release button it doesn't matter does it so I press the shutter button and then 10 seconds later the photo is taken so the camera is not moving it's nice and stable and solid and, and still and this means I can also use the lowest ISO for my Canon 6D which is 100 and that that's it really, that's how you take a photo, I don't want to overcomplicate it, don't want to overthink about it, but I'm going to do some more talking, so here's the talky bit. Right, all I want to say here is that you should take time, thought and care, taking a photo, and when I say take time, we're talking a matter of seconds with practice, it might sound like a lot what I've told you about, but... Get into the habit of doing all these things every time you take a photo and your photos will improve and it, and it won't take you long and hopefully you'll enjoy taking photos more. This is the other thing I want to get out of this. If you know how to take photos, you can enjoy it more because you know what you're doing and you're getting better photos. All these small things I teach you, they, they all add together and the sum of all these bits will show itself in your photos hopefully. And and this is this is what a professional photographer does. They apply all these things to each photo that they take. All those little bits and snippets that they've learned over the years. It all gets shut together in the taking of a photo and it does make a difference. Okay, what if I use a phone to take photos and not a camera? Well, there isn't as much checking of the settings, is there? Of course there isn't. But you can do the rest of the stuff I've told you about. Give it a go, see what happens. Now, if we've used smartphone cameras as devices to take photos with, why would we not take the same time and care over taking photos? Why not indeed? Just because a phone is an instant device, it doesn't mean you have to take every photo instantly. No, with time, thought and care, we can all take much better photos with our phones. Smartphone photography is photography to me, so there's no reason not to take better pictures with your phone. Of course, you could post your photos on social media straight away using a camera phone, but I don't do this. And that's the big difference, obviously, between a phone and a camera, that instantness. It doesn't bother me, and that's why I still use a camera, because I'm not that bothered about the instantness. I nearly went up to instantability then, but I don't think that's a word, so I think I should move on. What if I use a film camera? All of the above applies, but you can't check what you have like you can with a digital camera, can you? So you have to be super careful with your settings. And if you want to change the ISO, you have to change the film, which it's not... Well, I said here it's not a great idea, is it? Sometimes it's your only choice. That or have two cameras, which was my light bulb moment that came to me. Oh, just now, basically. But this is why I recommend to anyone who wants to learn photography that taking photos with a film camera is a great discipline. That's how I learn, but... To be fair, when I started in photography, I don't believe the word digital even existed. What do I do? I've told you how I physically take photos. And these best practices, they, they help me to get sharp handheld photos. I compose using the rule of thirds. The grid lines help me capture a building's outline. And the horizontal lines help me to get the building level. And the vertical lines help me to get the building upright. And that saves me a ton of time later when I'm processing my photos. It's a dead simple thing and it's a dead helpful thing. I use natural light plus the lighting designed and built into the buildings. These give me the best light for my work. I don't use artificial lights because the lighting in building has been designed for the people who live, work and use the buildings. And that's what I want to convey in my photos, which is why I don't introduce any of the lights. Now, that might sound like a cop-out to make life easier for myself, but that's where my photography has evolved to, and I'm more than comfortable with that. I use AV mode on my Canon 6D DSLR camera. I set the aperture, and the camera sets the shutter. I use the shutter speed that the camera chooses. My camera's on a tripod, so I don't need to worry about the shutter speed unless there's fast-moving clouds, trees, rivers, or other similar objects. I take 99% of my photos with my camera on a tripod, so shutter speed is just not an issue to me. And I use auto bracketing, taking three photos with different exposures which are merged together later in Lightroom. 
This is also called high dynamic range photography, but if you call it auto bracketing, people will say, oh yeah, good work there. If you say you do HDR, the pitchforks will be out. Yep, still an issue. And of course, I photograph buildings that are not moving. Well, at least I hope they're not anyway. I also use auto white balance and raw format, raw image files, so I can change the white balance later. Well, it makes life easier for me, so why not? Okay, for my architectural photography work, I tend to focus a third into the scene and use an aperture of f8 most of the time, f16 if I've got something in the foreground that I want to get in the frame as well. And this is with a 17mm focal length. I do have other camera lenses, but I tend to stick with my Canon 17 to 40 millimeter lens. It just works for me. And focusing a third in, it's not a bad rule of thumb, especially with a wide angle lens. Now, I know it's not that precise, but it gives you a start if you're not sure. And good old ISO. I use ISO 100. I only change from ISO 100 if I'm taking handheld photos and the only way to get a shutter speed that is fast enough is to use a higher ISO. And I don't think I've ever used an ISO of more than 1600. I've used 200, I've used 400, I don't remember using 800. But I, I think I used 3200 once and, and the noise was horrendous. I think I was just experimenting with an old camera. But ISO 100, 200 if I need to, 400 if I need to, and not much more than that. And that's what I do. Yeah, I do take photos of my iPhone. And I use the default camera app, and, and that's it really. But I use my Canon 6D for my client work. This is the best camera I've ever owned. Even though it's 10 years old now, it still does a wonderful job for me. It doesn't have that many camera features, but this is part of why I love it. Because I don't want them and I don't need them. So why would I spend money on a camera with things I'm not going to use? And I also love landscape photography, which is my taking photos for me time. And between us, I, I take my landscape photos in pretty much the same way I take my, my architectural photos. There ain't much difference. But I do aim to produce high quality images every time I take photos. And the fewer photos I take, the better. If I can get one or two great photos, I'm happy. I don't take a lot of photos anymore, and I haven't done that for a long time. And that was the longest what do I do ever. But this is what I do. Right, some thoughts from the last episode. Well, my one photo rule. I want to say something about that. When I say take one photo, I really do mean it. If you want to take more than one photo of something, then of course, that's up to you. It's fine. I know there's always more than one composition of anything and that just taking one photo sounds really restrictive. But what I used to do was take loads of photos of the same thing and then try and find a decent composition in Lightroom afterwards. This is the wrong way around. Now I'm happy just getting that one photo and being completely honest, I cannot think of a time when I wish I'd taken another photo from a different angle or position. And, and I had a good old think about this. and I can't think of a time when I've gone, oh, I wish I'd just gone a bit to the left or a bit to the right. No, I'm, I'm happy to spend the time getting the best photo that I can. Right, next episode. Camera gear, what to buy and how to use it. Now, this of course is a biggie and it might be a two-parter. I don't know why I wrote that because as soon as I wrote that, I knew it was going to be a two-parter. So I'm going to say here and now that I'm going to cover what to buy in the next episode and a big part of this is going to be the what not to buy. So you don't need the latest, greatest, expensive camera. The camera I use is 10 years old. It was a great camera 10 years ago, and it's still a great camera now. Ask me a question. If you have a question you would like me to answer, email me at sales at rinkmacavoyphotography.co.uk or head over to the podcast website, photographyexplainedpodcast.com. And if you just want to say hi, just say hi. I just love hearing from my listeners. OK, get an email from me. Well, yeah, if you'd like to receive a weekly email from me, and why wouldn't you? Where I tell you what I'm thinking about, fill out the form on the podcast website and every Friday, 3pm time where I'm sat, you will get a lovely email from me. Right, I'm done. This episode was brought to you by a homemade, 
chicken and cranberry sandwich washed down with an ice cold Diet Pepsi before I settled in my homemade acoustically cushioned recording emporium. It does say still no crisps there, but I did have a bag of crisps today. They were, I can't remember what they were now either. <laughs> That'll come back. I'll, I'll, I'll find out and I'll mention that in the next episode. But I had a, I had a bag of crisps, but they, they were healthy ones at that. Right, I'm going to stop there. I've been Rick McAvoy. Thanks again very much for listening to my small but perfectly formed podcast, it says here, and for giving me 27-ish minutes of your valuable time. I think this episode will be about 23 minutes long after I've edited out the mistakes and other bad stuff. We'll find out in a bit. OK, then. I hope to see you on the next episode. Take care. Stay safe. Cheers from me, Rick. <laughs>